Um, lupus signs and symptoms are so very similar to other disease processes out there that sometimes you're misdiagnosed. And I hate to use the word misdiagnosed because if you have 15 different disease processes that have the same signs and symptoms, you know, like which one do you go for? Do you just like reach inside of a hat and pick it out and say, oh, it's this one? Um, so it's kind of, you know, it's kind of hard. But by time lupus is normally diagnosed, it's in its advanced stages. So it's always better to try and get more definitive diagnosis in its early stages. So that way those signs and symptoms can be minimized and they can be controlled because if it advances, then it can affect multiple organs. It's a multi-organ, multi-system autoimmune disorder. So you can also go into uh, organ failure. So, so we know that it's an anti-inflammatory disease that affects multi-organs. Um, we can have leukopenia. We can have thrombocytopenia um, with lupus. Go back here. And systemic-wise, it affects the skin, the joints, the membranes, the renal system. Uh, if you have um, positive protein and low red blood cell count in your uh, kidneys, that's going to show up. Um, hematological, neurological uh, disease processes, and we're going to go um, through those. And this is just some more of the criteria that you would have to be present, that would have to be present during that physical examination. Um, in order to give you a definitive diagnosis of lupus. So it's chronic, it's progressive, it doesn't go away, but it can be controlled with treatments. Um, the disease is unpredictable. One day you could be okay, and then the next day you could totally not be okay. Um, one friend of mine in Atlanta, um, she was in the AT&T store getting a phone, and she said she was talking to the cashier, and then all of a sudden she got really hot and sweaty, and then she said she doesn't remember anything else, and she woke up a month later in the ICU. Um, and that's when they ran all of these barrage of tests, and of course they ordered way many more because they couldn't figure out what had happened. And she had lupus. She had lupus for quite some time because it affected all of her organs. It affected her heart, it affected her lungs, it affected her kidneys, it affected her liver. and she almost died. Um, right now, it's been a year, and she's been on the lupus medications. She's been on the medications that are treating, that are all related to her signs and symptoms that she's having, and she's probably made about 10 trips to the ICU in the past year, um, anywhere from a week to two weeks. Been on the medical floor a couple of times, but on the medical floor, they can't manage her condition, so she ends up in the ICU. Um, and this is just out of nowhere. Um, she was asked, well, did you notice these little signs and symptoms here and there? Because the cause for lupus, just like, you know, the uh, multiple sclerosis, is kind of unknown. You know, they kind of gear it toward genetics or um, environmental factors, or maybe you had a past history. Maybe you had um, Epstein-Barr virus when you were a kid. You know, and then, okay, 20 years later, now you have lupus. You know, was it related to that? So some of the different causative factors are just commonalities in patients, and so that's how they come up with these possible risk factors. So the incidences that occur with lupus is very unpredictable. Even if you're on medication, um, you can be in remission one minute, and then the disease flares up, and so those medications that you're on are not strong enough to manage your symptoms, and so then you end up with an exacerbation. So two out of eight people are affected. Um, it can occur in childbearing years. Uh, a lot of women will show up with signs and symptoms of lupus after they have had a child. Um, that's the same thing with hypothyroid. You know, it kind of manifests itself um, afterwards. Um, and African Americans are definitely um, have a higher rate for lupus than um, Hispanics or, or than whites. Um, Hispanics are next. Native Americans are third. Within my past month working in the ER, I have had three black females that have all presented with exacerbation symptoms of lupus. One was 19, one was 32, and one was 54 
all like within the last three weeks um, of working. So the age range, um, there's a range. It's the range is anywhere between 14 to 50, uh, 15 to 44, but you can definitely manifest some signs and symptoms uh, later on. So again, there's no causative factors. It can be viral, it can be bacterial, it can be hormonal. Um, it could be certain medications. Maybe you're on steroids. Maybe you were on a certain type of antibiotic. There's, you know, there's definitely um, no relation um, and no cause as to why if someone had those same things going on. So me and Morgan could both have a history of Epstein-Barr virus when we were little. We both could have had a child. We both could have maybe been on penicillin, and then I would have lupus, but she wouldn't or she would have lupus and I wouldn't, or we both would have lupus, but my condition would be different than hers. So no two conditions of lupus are the same, and no two treatments are the same. So each person um, kind of has a unique way um, of the way that they're being treated. So lupus occurs when our antibodies um, that are produced by the uh, B cells mistake our body as foreign and so it starts to attack. So not only does it attack one area, but it attacks multi areas. Because remember, this is a multi systemic um, immunity disorder, just like rheumatoid arthritis is a multi system um, disorder. And they don't have a reason as to why the immune system breaks down, meaning why isn't it strong enough to withhold or withstand you know, the attack that's um, being done. So clinical manifestations can range anywhere from very mild to rapidly progressing and affecting body organs, which I gave you an example of my one friend. She thought she was fine one day, and then the next day she totally collapsed. Most common areas are going to be the skin, where you'll see some rashes, the lining of some lung, uh, so you can have some scar tissue, the heart, you can have um, abnormal heart rhythms. Um, nerves can be affected, and also you can go into kidney failure as well. So dermatologic-wise, um, the butterfly rash is um, also known as mallard, M-A-L-L-A-R-D, so that's one of the most common symptoms of lupus. However, there are a lot of people of um, different ethnic backgrounds, especially darker skin tone, who don't present with the rash. Just like um, if someone were to get bit by a tick, you know, and if you see the bullseye, you know, usually you would see it on someone of a lighter color. My son had Lyme's disease and he got bit by a tick, obviously. But when they looked, you know, all over his body, there was no um, bullseye. And then that's when the doctor had told us, oh, well, people usually have ethnic, you know, darker skin. They don't present with a bullseye. Not that you can't see it, but for some reason or something that goes along with the skin, you know. So um, the cutaneous vascular lesions. Um, you're going to have those lesions on multiple organs. They'll be noted. Um, oral nasopharyngeal ulcers, um, they can pop up periodically. Usually they're painless. And then the hair loss. And usually the hair loss is noted in the temporal region. So this next picture here, you can see um, where the butterfly rash is on the face and usually if you think of a butterfly rash you think of maybe someone who was getting face painted or just a picture of a butterfly that it would be you know like a full face butter butterfly but usually it's it's below and on the cheek areas musculoskeletal wise we're going to have um, arthritic pain with morning stiffness as far as the swan neck the honor deviation um, and the irregularity of the joints, that's very similar to the rheumatoid arthritis, so you can um, go ahead and just look at those um, pictures for that. For the cardiopulmonary section, tachypnea, pleurosy, so inflammation of the pleural lining, you can have some abnormal heart rhythms. Um, having lupus, just like rheumatoid arthritis, puts you at risk for early cardiovascular disease because with lupus, you can get a condition called vasculitis. So that can be inflammation and hardening of the veins and the arteries. Um, and then with those flare-ups, you know, scar tissue doesn't go away. Scar tissue builds up. 
So with the back and forth of the flare-ups and the remissions, um, puts you at risk for early cardiovascular disease. For the renal system, you can have something called lupus nephritis. And so that's inflammation of the kidneys. Um, the kidney starts to fail. One of the ways that you can tell that this renal failure is related to lupus is that the blood work and biopsy are going to be positive for proteins and your patient's going to have low uh, red blood cell count. So our primary goal here is to try and prevent the progression of renal disease because we don't want our patient to end up on dialysis. So we need to make sure that we administer those steroids, fluids, make sure that we keep those kidneys, um, you know, going, and then antibiotics if needed, and then the biological um, medications that can help block that process. Nervous system. Um, central nervous system. So we can have seizures. You know, if you think of the nervous system, it's your brain and spinal cord and nervous nerves. So anything that's associated with that whole system here. Numbness and tingling in the upper and lower extremities. And then as far as cognitive status, any type of mental fogginess. So confusion, difficulty concentrating, um, not being able to recall some things, and your patient can even present with a little bit of depression, anxiety, or psychosis. Hematologic, um, I talked about the vasculitis where we have the inflammation of the blood vessels, so that can occur. Um, leukopenia, low white blood cell count. Um, when someone has lupus, they're not necessarily uh, leukopenic all the time, and if those levels are low, it doesn't mean that they're definitely at risk for infection, but it does contribute um, to that. Um, you have decreased red blood cell production. So with that, depending on how low the blood goes, we can give our patients some Procrit, and if we have leukopenia, then we can give our patients some Neupogen. Um, and then if our patient had thrombocytopenia, then we could administer Numega, okay? So just like the rheumatoid arthritis, usually patients are at risk for infection because the immune system is altered, not necessarily that they have low white blood cell count. And continuing on with the hematologic, uh, we just talked about thrombocytopenia. Um, with the decreased platelets. You can have some coagulopathy issues related to your antiphospholipid antibody syndrome that occurs, and that puts your body at risk for making clots. So not just clots in one specific area, but clots in multiple areas. So the heart, the brain, the lungs, your patient's at risk for stroke, your patient's at risk for heart attack, your patient's at risk for um, infarcts in the lungs, and even throughout the different um, body systems. So liver, kidneys, you can have infarcts um, in any type of area. And then, of course, with the immune system being altered, your patient's at risk for infections. So depending on how, how the exacerbation of symptoms are, depending on the presentation of your patient, we may want to put this patient on isolation precautions. Okay, not necessarily we're being protected from the patient, but the patient being protected from us. So that would be called reverse isolation. Um, I showed you um, that whole panel of tests that was done for me. Um, so there's really no specific test. It's just a bunch of criteria. You know, does the patient you know, meet this criteria for a diagnosis of lupus, um, or do they not? You do have some antibodies here. Um, ANA could be elevated, but remember, the ANA is and the ESR are just nonspecific inflammatory markers. It just says, yes, there's some inflammation going on here. So it's going to be a lot of that antibody testing. Um, 
And the ones that have been in more patients diagnosed with lupus are the anti-DNA and the anti-Smith, which is also on my screen that I had showed you guys. I just didn't open it up. Um, and they were negative. CBC, um, diagnostic test for lupus. CBC doesn't necessarily, um, we're looking for low white blood cell count. Um, but again, the low white blood cell count can be for different types of disorders. It could be uh, if you're on any DMARs or biological drugs already. It could be someone who has leuko, um, leukemia. It could be someone who has leukopenia that could be related to another disease process. Maybe they're on cancer treatment. So, of course, there's a whole lot of things that you have to take into consideration as far as the diagnostic measures with lupus. Um, the UA, we talked about the lupus nephritis with the kidney failing. So, we're going to be checking for uh, red blood cells, white blood cells um, in the kidneys. X-rays of the affected joints, you know, just to see what's going on with them. Um, chest x-ray, looking for scar tissue, but then also looking for something that's called lupus pneumonitis. So that's pneumonia that's related to lupus. And then the EKG, where we're just looking for abnormal heart rhythms that could be occurring with lupus. So the prognosis is going to depend on how early your patient is diagnosed. The earlier, the better. The earlier medications can get on board to decrease some of these signs and symptoms, the better outcome, hopefully, um, it's going to be for your patient. As far as monitoring organs and careful organ monitoring, what do you think that we would do for a lot of our organs as far as monitoring? Tyler? So what do you think some of our tests would be to check for organ function? Okay. So, you know, any type of, yep, any type of blood test that's going to be specific to an organ. So, you know, our BUN and creatinine is going to be for our kidneys, right? Um, we can also check for electrolyte imbalances for the heart. We can do LFTs for the liver. Um, say it one more time. Yes, ammonia levels can be elevated um, with liver um, disorder. Um, you know, checking the pancreas. You know, all of those different um, tests. So drug therapy, we have the NSAIDs for the inflammation. We want to decrease the inflammation because if we can get a handle on that, um, that's at least half of the battle because the patient's not going to be in pain and they're going to be able to move around and, you know, have a little bit of energy. Um, how many of you have been sick or have had some type of inflammatory process that's gone on sometime or another? Any? No? One, two? Everybody's healthy. <laughs> that's good. Um, but when you're sick, just think about when you're sick. If you've just had just a common cold, not necessarily the flu or pneumonia, you just kind of feel washed out, wiped out. You don't want to do anything. You just want to lay around in the bed all day, right? So just think about these people who, you know, have this inflammatory process going on. Their immune system is attacking them. You know, their body's too weak to fight it off. And they're just pretty beat. You know, they're, they're not able to do anything. So their quality of life, little by little, is you know, going down, you know. Um, I know my one friend, the one that I told you about, she hasn't worked in a year because she can't stay out of the, you know, out of the hospital, you know. So she's feeling down and, you know, she has someone who's picking up the bills and taking care of, you know, she got married and everything. But, um, you know, it just, you know, just makes you feel kind of down on yourself. Um, Anti-malarial drug of choice is Plaquenil which is the same anti-malarial drug that's used for the rheumatoid arthritis. But it can cause some vision disturbances, so just um, make sure that your patient has frequent eye checkups. Um, we have our steroid drugs, okay? So, you know, our cortisone, solumedrol, 
there are 20 different types of anti-inflammatory drugs, so depending on what the doctor sees fit for that patient, they may order one or the other. Um, the immunosuppressant drugs, so we have our DMARDs, um, to name a few. We have our methotrexate. We have the Plaquenil. Excuse me. Um, that's the same with the rheumatoid arthritis. We also have biological drugs. So a new one is called Benlista, B-E-N-L-Y-S-T-A. That came out in about 2011. And then we have Rytoxin, um, ry Rytoxican, R-Y-T-O-X-I-C-A-N. And so the biological um, medications that are used are more aimed toward stopping those B cells from attacking the immune system. So trying to suppress um, them from releasing antibodies and attacking the immune system. So for management for our patients, we're going to do a physical assessment along with the primary care provider and we're going to see about their support system because someone who has lupus, you know, definitely needs a support system. That's part of our assessment. And these patients, we know that the number one thing with them is going to be inflammation and pain. So that should be our priority, providing that nothing else is going on with the patient. Of course, during the nursing assessment, you're going to gather any subjective or objective um, information, and also looking at any test reports, so x-rays, MRIs, CAT scans, you know, EKGs, ultrasounds, all that kind of thing. Um, if this is a new diagnosis, then we definitely want to make sure that we provide education to the patient in the family in its simplest form. Um, of course, the rheumatologist would be the one um, that would give them the big bulk of the medication, but we have some pretty nifty patient education um, programs on the computers in the hospitals, and they're basically written at a fifth grade level because nationwide that's about the, um, the reading level. And so all the, all the medical discharges and the patient educations are written at that level, so that way everyone, no matter what level you're on, whether you're down here or whether you're up here, you're still able to understand. Because there are people that are up here that are not familiar with medical terminology. So there are a lot of people that are not familiar with medical terminology, so you have to break it down. And if you're going to use a medical word, then you need to, you know, use the, the definition. Um, I had um, one student who told their patient, I'm going to give you an IM shot. And the patient was like, okay, but do regular people know what IM is? No, um, especially if you have a patient in the hospital whose you know, mental faculties are really not all there that much. It's, I have to give you a shot in your arm. You know, it's going to go in your muscle. You know, so you know, just make sure that we break things down like that a little bit. So some nursing diagnosis, we have the inflammation, we have the fatigue, impaired skin integrity. There's, there's lots more nursing diagnosis that can be used for someone with lupus. It depends on if they are effectively, you know, coping, you know, are they at risk for it, are they depressed, um, body image disturbance, you know, it could be that they have those um, lesions on their body or that they have um, the butterfly rash that doesn't go away, that could be body image disturbance, you know, because it's something that they haven't had before. Um, uh, what else was I going to say? There was something I was going to say. I just lost it. It had to do with nursing diagnosis. I'm sure I'll probably come back around to it. Um, overall goals, well, if our problem is pain, then what's our goal going to be? Right? Minimize pain, acceptable level of pain, no pain, you know, whatever it is that your goal is going to be. Um, you know, if they have fatigue and activity intolerance, you know, then your goal is going to be specific to that. And then your plans, you know, planning everything, and then those implementations, those interventions, you're going to put them into practice. Um, now, health promotion, how can we prevent lupus if we don't know what's causing it? Because there are so many different triggers, right? Um, so I don't know if prevention is possible, 
but definitely early diagnosis and treatment at its best um, to help minimize those symptoms. And even people who have lupus can live for quite some time. Treatment, diagnosis, you know, trying to maintain, making sure that if our patients don't have insurance, that maybe we can try and work with case management to see if, um, you know, we can get them some type of treatment. Sometimes there's charities. Sometimes there's doctors who will write off bills. Um, I know this one lady, she was in a hospital. Her bill was $15,000. She didn't qualify for insurance. And the doctor told them to write it off that they didn't want to, you know, charge. And they, they paid her bill in full. So there are some, you know, some doctors that, you know, that do that. And also just support, 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 right? Um, the little young girl that I had in the ER over the weekend, she just had overall body aches. The only thing that she was on was um, Paxil for the depression, and she was on Vicodin for the pain. They didn't have her on NSAIDs anymore, and Plaquenil was on her allergy list. So, um, and she just got tired of having flare-ups, and she said, you know what, I just want to kill myself. I can't deal with this anymore. 18 years old just diagnosed a year ago. So we have to make sure that we have support um, for, these, for these patients. Um, during exacerbations, just like our COPD patients, um, you know, just like someone who has gout's pretty mild, but you know, any type of exacerbations, usually it comes on, it might be mild, it might be abruptly. So we have to make sure that we're there and that we're providing treatment um, quickly and efficiently. So these are some signs and symptoms that we want to observe for, and this is pre-treatment and during treatment, because we want to make sure that the symptoms are residing and that the patient is getting better. Okay. Monitoring weights and I's and O's, especially if the patient's presenting with the lupus nephritis. Doctor may or may not order a 24-hour urine collection sample, and that's usually just checking the creatinine clearance, making sure that the kidneys are functioning as they should and filtering as they should. Neurological status, you know, is the patient awake or oriented? Are they confused? Are they forgetful? Are they depressed? Are they tearful? You know, are they okay one minute, and then the next minute it looks like they're stroking out? Because it could be that the antiphospholipid syndrome kicked in, that they had a clot and it went to the brain. You know, and now they have a CBA. So, you know, just monitoring your patients um, closely. And support, support, support. Um, ambulating when they can. You know, during those exacerbation periods, they're going to be in pain. They're, they're not going to want to move. They're not going to want to do anything. So, again, if we can manage that pain, then we can get our patients to pretty much do whatever it is that we want to do. So things that we want to avoid when someone's in an exacerbation state is the sun seems to make them more fatigued when someone has lupus. So we try to um, avoid the sun, maybe provide them with some artificial light or maybe just put the light on in the, you know, pull up the shades in the room a little bit so at least they're getting some sun. Um, decreasing stress in their life if they have an infection, making sure that they're on antibiotics. Teaching energy cons conservation that goes along with the activity intolerance. So just like someone who has rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis or someone who's had surgery, um, someone who had an amputation, all of those types of disease processes, we want to try to conserve energy. So we're going to, you know, divide our time up, you know, activity and rest, activity and rest. You know, how, how are you going to divide that time, okay? Um, and then there are just some more nursing interventions that go along there. Um, infertility, um, if someone's trying to get pregnant and they haven't had any children yet, because of the drugs, they can make you infertile. Um, so, you know, I know some people have said, you know what, well, I'll just go ahead and deal with the disease because I really want to have a, you know, a baby and then I'll deal with it after the fact. You know, there have been women who were pregnant that were diagnosed with 
you know, uterine cancer or breast cancer, and then they took their chances. They still wanted to have a baby, you know, and deal with the consequences later. So that has to be a lot of counseling and education um, for this type of patient. Um, and if they are pregnant and they had an exacerbation and it occurred, that there's a chance that they could lose um, the baby, especially if they're in early stages of pregnancy. Uh, we just have to make them aware that that's early miscarriage is definitely um, a condition that can occur. Psych issues that goes along with the depression, anxiety, you know, psych is psych. You know, we want to listen to our patients. We want to provide good therapeutic communication. We want to watch our body language. Um, we don't want to give any false reassurance. We don't want to say it's okay or, you know, I know someone who has lupus and they've lived for 30 years already, you know, because every, every case is different. They could be okay one minute and then, you know, dead the next, all right? And then your evaluations, as always, it's the end of a care plan. So you're evaluating what did you do for this patient? Did it work? Did it not work? And what is it that you can do differently?